I welcome you very much to um, the lecture of Ursula Stenger and Oktay Belgi, both from the University of Cologne. Um, I briefly introduce both. Um, Ursula Stenger, she's a professor for educational science uh, with a focus on early childhood education and um, her research fields are early childhood education, of course, anthropology and phenomenology, cultural and aesthetic education, learning cultures, and the theoretical foundation of early childhood education. And in this context, um, there is a book or um, um, a handbook called uh, Theoretische Zugänge in der Pädagogik der frühen Kindheit, Theoretical Approaches in the Early Childhood Education. She's the editor and the author. Um, not, not alone the author, of course. Um, and she's working on another book, um, Wie Raumqualitäten entstehen, how qualities of um, experiencing space uh, emerge. Um, so it's uh, uh, also located in the early childhood education, so space and um, quality. And um, Oktay Bilgi, uh, he's a research assistant um, in the uh, Department of uh, Bildungsphilosophie, Anthropologie und Pädagogik der Lebensspanne, also theory of, uh, philosophy of Bildung and anthropology and uh, pedagogy of life span, perhaps. And uh, he wrote his uh, dissertation with the title Over, uh, Über die Figur des Neuanfangs im pädagogischen Denken. It's a, it's, um, um, a fundamental, uh, um, fundamental theory um, to the beginning of pedagogical thinking in pedagogy in pedagogical theory, perhaps, so how to say. So, um, thank you very much for coming here. Um, we are curious, making the complexity of realities tangible. Please. So, thank you. We prepared uh, it together and I will uh, present it. Uh, about ethical, ecological aspects of collaborative constitutions of reality in the context of early childhood education and care, easy, easy. Uh, first point, theoretical and met method methodological approaches. A social and scientific principle supposedly based on progress has enabled the domination of nature oriented towards limitless economic growth. If one follows current diagnosis of this era, such as the Anthropocene, then we are living in a geochronological epoch that is characterized by destructive changes to the ecosystem caused by human activity. Experts agree that anthropogenic factors are causing the sixth great mass extinction on this planet. What does this have to do with daycare and other forms of institutionalized early childhood education and care. The multidimensionality of socio-ecological matters also includes education and care in early childhood. How can fundamentally different relationships to nature emerge in childhood? Possible alternative realities for a coexistent with different species. In order to develop new ways of living together, it seems significant that we allow ourselves to become co-involved in cross-species processes of reality generation thing. We take these questions as an entry point for explorations in the field of early childhood education, using the empirical example of a place history of all human encounters. Oh, I have to click. Uh, all, you see the bird here. All human encounters um, moment, collected as part of ethnographic phenomenological research in the context of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research founded project on spatial qualities. 
In a nature-based daycare center, we pursue the question of how places are produced collect collaboratively, i.e. through the different interaction of living beings, forces and conditions as heterogeneous stru structures emerging from the interweaving of natures and cultures, the material and the discursive. Places center people and other living beings spatially, with their bodies, with other matter and horizons that co-constitute these places. You can perceive a place through a way people and other living beings connect with it, but you only explore it phenomenologically if you pursue these connections, ponder them, trace them and make them visible in research. But how can phenomenology contribute to tracing shared realities with more than humans? On the one hand, Leib phenomenological approaches, such as that of Merleau-Ponty and Nancy, can assist in looking more closely what happens between bodies in the intermediary space that spans, as Nancy describes it, citation, so too the body or bodies that we try to touch through thought, psyche's body, the being extended and outside itself of presence to the world, birth, a spacing, citation, corpus. It is these in-between spaces that we need to seek out and make accessible in our phenomenological research. The, re the reflections of Corinne Pelluchon, a French phenomenologist, are particularly fruitful for exploring our questions. In her book of the same name, with reference to Levinas, she asks the question, what do we live from? Her work is concerned with thinking Heidegger and being in the world further in such a way that, citation Peluchon, man's belonging to a reality that nourishes him or her and is at the same time expressed naturally and culturally, citation. The natural world is inhabited by many entities and we do not exist independently of them. But what does it mean to inhabit this earth together? We are immersed in this natural reality through our physicality. We breathe, drink water, feed on other living beings, but also from a side of a field of sunflowers, the laughter of a child, the wind on our skin, or an evening with friends. From these thoughts, Peluchon develops a phenomenology of food. What nourishes me constitutes me. The pleasure, including aesthetic pleasure, that we can have in each other is a nourishing form of connectedness. Citation, Peluchon, existence is thus not only individual, it is also collective for we belong to a common world composed of the work of our ancestors, the biosphere in its entirety and biodiversity, citation. Ensuring human and non-human existence in shared sensuality, Peluchon offers a conception of dynamic realities in the in-between of materialities, bodies, and constitutions of meaning beyond the dualism of culture and nature. For a further concretization of our project, we refer to post-humanist research approaches that question the centrity, centrality of the human being, and thus also the dualism of human being and nature, as is done by Haraway, among others. In contrast to social constructivist and individualist approaches, post-humanism considers bodily embedded and situated connectedness with our other living beings as the ontological basis of ecological existence. The radical question is, citation Peluchon, what kind of knowledge and spiritual values do we produce today as a society? Citation. This is a question that we as scientists must also ask ourselves what emerges from the knowledge we produce. 
What realities are created by the way we question and research? What alternative realities and subject configurations can be made possible through alternative ways of perceiving and resensing? Research approaches from the international discourse of so-called childhood nature studies concretize these questions and point out citation, that children, no matter where they are, engaging a range different types of nature. Citation. For this type of research, methods of post-qualitative research are used to capture promising unexpected moments with open, also unplanned approaches that react to the environment, also referred to as messy. Vladimirova and Rautzio. Posthumanist informed research in the context of the Common World Research Collective Research Network, for example, should also be seen in connection with this concern. Within the framework of multi-species ethnographies between children, kangaroos, frogs, etc., new possibilities of human nature relationship are investigated empirically and conceptually for a pedagogy in the Anthropocene. We had already argued with Peluchon that the phenomenology of food sensitized to the sensory and bodily ensuring of human and non-human living beings in common worlds. With a common world approach, we can now concretize, substantiate these shared worlds as sites of living and generative relations of bodies, non-human life forms, materialities, forces that collaboratively produce knowledge, feelings, imaginaries of belonging, a connectedness to place in a shared process of becoming. For a phenomenological investigation of places, a human owl encounter, we propose a methodological methodological approach of storytelling, following Haraway. Storytelling allows us to be open to the surprising and the unplanned. The stories told include those that have been told to us by professionals and children and that we have observed ourselves. These stories are also the result of differentiated analysis of video materials, observations and conversations. Through stories, diverse traces of meaning and deep dimensions of reality can be included, made visible and experienced. Stories can involve us in the lives of other beings. They can generate sympathy, care, joy and a delight in the beauty of place. Second point, growing up together with owls. 2.1, previous history. The emergence of this place is set in a specific setting in which everyday life at the nature-oriented daycare center takes place, mainly outside, in summer and winter. This is the result of a long collaborative process through which the professionals say that they have now become outdoor people. Everything that is lived from, starting with natural materials in a large courtyard area, for working, building and playing, but also flower beds with flowers, vegetables, fruits and herbs is nourishment that is cared for. In this daycare center, places are always created where different forms of life meet, people and more than humans, as they say in posthumanism. Rosemary is smelled, as you see in these pictures, paddles in white water games, a girl makes friend with a straw flower surprise that it never begins to smell, children look into the fire, grasps in white snacking and dead animals are buried when found like mouse burial seen in the lower right hand corner. The daycare center was built in an old depot in a forest, a waste land as a professional say with time to defunction. The open garages are used and played with in many different ways. Before the owls visit, these garages hosted building room, dining room, preschool room, a studio. 
Building blocks and materials were freely accessible to the children and enjoyed great popularity. The dining room and the studio offered protection from wind and rain until one day all pellets were found. The German Nature Conservation Organization called NABU, Nature Conser Conservation Organization, was informed because a protected barn owl might have been looking for a nesting place here. And so an educator built one under NABU's guidance. At first nothing happened. The box just hung there above the building block area and life went on, on as usual until owl pellets were found again in spring. In May, the educator Sarah sends me a link to the platform Darn Chorus where she has uploaded an audio recording of a morning concert from the daycare. Different birds are singing and a barn owl can be clearly heard snoring. <laughs> Nabu installs a camera in the box, which brings certainty. Owls are indeed breeding there. 2.2. The owls take up space, perceptions in between. Immediately the space was transformed from play space to owl space. Haraway's speaks of entanglement the multiple entanglements between species that give rise to lived space with all its stories, rhythms and everyday choreographies. The educator Geza describes the initial experience with the owls. Citation, what a joy this is, so this being involved, so we didn't choose them, but somehow that was on the table and we took it. Citation, the owls were just there. But what does it mean to live with owls in a daycare center? The educator expresses quite ambivalent feelings, moment of dissociation from the familiar and the new, the different needs of humans and owls, repeatedly raise the issue of giving shelter. She says, it is also exhausting because we lose our shelter, so we got there and it stank like an animal park. So it smelled like carcasses. The dead mice provided by the owl parents are stacked upstairs as food. So everything was so devastated. And then I thought, oh no, now all eight transitional children are coming, the three-year-old. And we didn't make an initial visit with the children at all. We didn't do anything due to corona. I would like to have a ritual and reliability for them so that they can get used to daycare well. It didn't work. No, it didn't work. I was really angry and thought, this can't be true. Now we, can, we have to clean everything here. The familiar is challenged in the light of the other. The encounter with owls reveals something about boundaries of the familiar and the reliable. These boundary experiences can be unifying as they are divisive. The educator talks about how they decided in the team to engage with the pain of letting go and thus set in motion a transformation triggered by the encounter with the owls. The situation with the owls taken, take on something existentially close, as they say, where everything is part of it. The eating of the mice, the burying of dead bodies that were not eaten, death and life. A ladder with some branches is set up in front of the nest so the owl can land well and practice their flight. But of course, it's, uh, but of course they didn't stick to it. Educator Geza explains, the owl takes possession. That is so funny. Then they try to move around the owl children, and where are they? They practice in preschool. They have taken every room. The studio and dining room are also used for flying exercises. Citation. Use by the children is currently impossible. The educator reports further. I would say that is a home for owls, and I would go so far to say that we are the rather guests here. The pedagogically conceived and lived space of the people turned out to be owl space. During the day, the owls sleep. A child explains to us. 
We couldn't play in the room because owls can't sleep there. They didn't want that. When we had to eat there in the near, uh, we always had to chew really quietly. This space emerges as an in-between space, also in Nancy's sense. It stretches open between the owls and the people, the owl box and play spaces, and becomes physically tangible. Just as a strange of our droppings and dead mouse bodies is a bodily shared intermediary space of human owl encounters. Other touching moments are experienced. When the teachers and children watch the videos of the night camera together with the children, educator gazer says, and then you see how these owls fly. They are like that. Then it doesn't matter. The effort and toil, the giving over the room, the stench and the cleaning. Citation. The flight of the owl becomes a phenomenon, an altered possibility of perception in order to share this flight with the owl. This is not a project, this is real life, she says. It is not only humans who empower themselves, op occupy space, reinterpret re space, but owls also set owl-like spatial changes in motion. Haraway speaks here of response ability, to respond to a particular situation. To respond is to challenge each other, to engage with the other, to enable each other, to encounter the emerg emergent problems of coexistence. What pedagogical realities emerge concretely between owls, children and educators? We want to focus on the lift in between space as an interse intersectional point of discourses, imaginations, affects local narratives and technical apparatus. 2.3. Discursive material realities of knowledge, the owl cinema. Important in the process with the owls was a so-called owl cinema seeing the video how the owls grow, how they devour the mouse whole, how they practice flying when they themselves, the children, sleep at night. This gave the children impressions of the animal's way of life that they almost never got to see. In a way, the nocturnal camera gave them widened eyes and ears to perceive what happens at night when they are not there. The preschool children pre prepare questions for Nabu. Among other things, they want to know, citation, question of the children. How does the division of the mice work for the small and the big owls? When do parents eat? How big can owls get? How old? How fast can they fly? What is their wingspan? How quickly do owls learn to fly? How do owls spit out pellets? How do owls protect themselves from danger, i.g. when the troll comes? What is dangerous for owls? Were there already owls in pirate times? It is about a knowledge that is not cut off from common life, that can help to understand, appreciate life realities the meaningful foundation of the life of the other and respond to them appropriately. 2.4. Imaginative realities. The conversation with Nabu expands the children's imagination. This is continued in painted pictures of owls at night, which are created afterwards. Places for creation and exploration emerge nomadically sometimes here, sometimes there, near the owls. They are stocked with paints, paper and pens and gather the children who come and paint and leave in turn. A large documentation wall about the owls is also created. You see it uh, on the right side. These pictures are shown us uh, by the teacher Barbara and the child Paolo. At the top in the left, Paolo says, shows us his owl. He says, 
the, her elegant wings, he, the owl has elegant wings because its flight is so silent at night. Daddy Owl, here in the picture, is just bringing a mouse to the owl box. He shows the claws with which it killed the mouse. Blood runs down. The mouse is laid down on the pole in front of the owl box for the young owls. Beforehand, he had made sketches to practice the wing and body structure. He also knows down feathers, body feathers, wing feathers, and says to us, Owls eat mice. I don't think that's good, because then the mice die, and there are only very few left. But the owls need that, otherwise they won't survive. It's good for the owl, but bad for the mice. Citation. I sit next to him at lunch outside. He points out to me that there are always mice running along the wall waiting for the food to fall under the table. In fact, it doesn't take time for two minutes before the first mice come. Uh, it's a cycle, a teacher explains me. We eat here so the mice can multiply, which then serve as food for the owls. Regarding the picture uh, uh, down, Barbara explains, like a white whale, the owls glide through the night. And all on the top, the picture of a girl shows the whole process of the owlets, owlets from the egg to the owl, partly mixed up with made stories. The owls develop their, o their own lives for the children. The children participate in the life of the owls, smell them, hear them, snoring, feel their presence. With Merleau-Ponty, one could say they feel in the flesh what is happening between them, the children, the owls, the rooms. And they try to understand, worry, and are outraged when one morning a marten can be seen on the night video that had made it to the owl box but found the nest empty. How can the owls give, be given shelter? Immediately the roof is sealed by the educators to protect the owls. Care, compassion, and fascination of the stranger are mixed here with the desire to understand exactly how they live. 2.5, laborative realities. Playful imaginations, questions, and efforts to pursue the existential experience with the owls are constantly present in everyday life. One day, they also get to take a closer look to the pellets. First, curiously, spontaneously, then accompanied by a teacher equipped with tweezers at a table where there is also a copy of a picture of a mouse skeleton. This place is visited for more than two hours. The children immerse themselves in picking out the tiny bones still stuck in the mouse fuel. They ponder what those bones might be, teeth, skull, claws, shoulder, ribs. They try to piece together a possible skeleton. Many participate, focused on the tiniest things they look at with their magnifying glasses. Experimental and exploratory practices support observatory, observator, observational skills and attention to encountering and living with owls. Emily would love to have an owl at home, as she expresses in a conversation with us. But, she says, owls at home are always difficult. Of course, the wings would be everywhere all the time. Barn owls are very big. The children play owls, dance as owls, run around the ground with their arms, swinging wide as owls, mimic the owls called calls at Noah says, we like to play owls in the quiet time. We always cuddle up to a nest, and then it looks like we are owls. Third and last point, how can multi-layered realities be experienced? A conclusion. The aim of our phenomenological exploration was to work out aspects and dimensions of collabor collaborative worlding using the example of a local history between owls, children, educators, room, and spaces. 
living together in the in-between of shared worlds can be explored with phenomenological approaches as an intercorporal, effective coming into being, but also letting go of shared realities. However, this does not mean that humans and owls experience the same thing. The owls remain strange and particular, as Geza says. Referring back to a book by the anthropologist Nastasia Martin, who was bitten by a bear in Kamchatka. We read it together. The strangeness of the owl's visit may remain strange, and yet it has a force, a transforming power. The children are highly open to this event, Geza says. They live with the owls every day, feel their presence sensually, see the beauty of light, empathize with and care for the owls and take responsibility. The children explore the owl's spaces, their crea excreations want to know in what way are owls different, how does it feel? Imaginations give answer. This place gathers people and owls in an existential manner. Children live with the owls, find themselves in relationship that touch, grisp, and unsettle them. In Pelichon's words, these experiences become nourishment, what they live from. Children and people are not limited to the concern of their individual existence. They can open up and transcend into the possible experience. I am part of the whole. I can feel the mystery of being born, of owls growing up, touching the death of mice, of participating in funerals of dead animals. I can feel life that goes beyond me. This also has an ethical dimension. It is not just about us, but about the need of other living beings on the earth. There, this is where the limits of a child-centered pedagogy in, envisioned in the educational plans also in ecological sustainable education become apparent. A child-centered pedagogy easily overlooks the needs of other living beings. What aspects co-constitute co these collaborative realities between humans and owls outlined here? Ecological developments, species extinction, protection of animals are present here. What we buy and consume in a daycare center also affects others. Pedagogical concepts and ideas respond to this and co-constitute ECE, early childhood education and care realities. But also the people who have become outdoor people here in this daycare and live with the rhythms of nature co-create these collaborative realities through their love of owls. The story of place can help to understand how, through diverse material, discursive, effective, imaginative, and experimental practices, these realities are respectively constituted. How spaces in space open up that allow other kinds of relationship of experience of the world and different kinds of learning to become possible. The space that emerges is full of challenges, joy, curiosity, anger, relations, and urgent ethical questions of coexistence. It is a place where stories create connections and connections create stories, where familiarity is created despite strangeness and intimacy with others is experienced. The animals know something about the place that we do not. And we know something about the place that the animals do not. This is what you can enjoy with Peluchon. Even if the owls are very special beings and the example here describes something singled out and extraordinary, in every urban daycare center there are living beings that can be perceived as being with, with the, whether they are ants, bees, or chalfes. What is the idea of education? What is the idea of care? 
Africa Taylor, together with other scholars of the Common World Research Collective, have written a UNESCO paper on this, learning to become with. Is a core idea here, how can we learn to become with others? The creation of the world is not an individual achievement, but a becoming with, which comes towards us, which is strange and yet its own. A living with that which goes beyond us and includes that which is entrusted to us. People, children, owls. The ethical dimension of these entanglements would perhaps be not to judge according to pre-established values, but to develop in becoming and caring respective points of view and possibilities that are good for all who share this place. Stories of togetherness freely and tired into can help to relativize anthropocenic boundary, drawing and create new narratives that make possible non-destructive, more hopeful and re-corruptive ways of living and dying together in the ruins of the Anthropocene, as Haraway and Singh says. Thank you. <laughs>